He's Chris Sims, Pro Football Talk, co-host with uh, Mike Florio, former NFL quarterback. First time in the uh, man cave, not bad digs. What? Yeah. Big time improvement. Damn, I mean, this is pretty special. I mean, the basketball court, tip top, great murals out there. It's a little cleaner in here. It's not infested <laughs> by you guys anymore. It's a lot better. It's an upgrade here. <laughs> it is. It is. And it we is. have a football field out there. Uh, yep. Uh, I'll play quarterback. Okay, sure. And Because uh, you'll play wide receiver. Uh, Make- where, where did Chris rank on the best quarterbacks we've had in studio? <laughs> well, we've had Joe Montana in studio, okay. though. Okay, well, I'm below him. We've had <laughs> Drew Brees in studio. Below him. I would say I'm towards the bottom of the list, no matter who but you the, had in the studio. Yes, McLovin. I think he was 71, right behind Blake Bortles. <laughs> oh, burn. Call, call back. Oh, Mc, yeah. Call, call back. Mc. Yeah. All right. Please, next year at the Super Bowl, set it up again. I want to throw balls as hard as I can at McLovin. Ooh, okay. You, you know? can do that next break. Oh, right, maybe we'll do that. Yeah. I will always take that. I want to abuse him. Yes. I go back to uh, the Giants drafting Daniel Jones, and I thought of your dad, believe it or not. People sure. made the comparison of Dave Brown in the supplemental draft with right. the Giants. Right. Out of nowhere, and we, you know, the Giants got all oh, this guy, this guy, Dave Brown, he's really talented, athletic. I go back to your dad who came out of Moorhead State, and nobody knew who your dad was. Yeah. And the reaction was not kind to your dad when he was drafted by the Giants, but no. it turned out well. I'm curious, if your dad had a chance to talk to Daniel Jones, yeah. what would he say? Uh, I think he would tell him, don't worry about the the media noise, the public, who cares? He'd probably say a swear word in there and go, I mean, what the hell do they know anyway? But how do you avoid it, Chris? It's New York. It's social media. They didn't have social media when your dad played. You're right. You're not going to avoid it no matter what. Even, you know, even staying off of social media, you're always going to have a friend or your mother or an aunt who's going to go, oh, did you see what they said about you today? You know, that, that always happened even to me back in the day before social media. So, yes, you're going to see that. But at the same time, I mean, are you going to hear those things? You, you, you know, there's a way to avoid it, at least to where it doesn't consume your day. To me, I still think it's crazy that some of these guys are on a social media as much as they are and they react the way they are to, to people who don't know really what the hell they're talking about anyways, and they get, you know, uh, a little, you know, hot over it altogether. But, you know, had the Giants seemed to like – these type of quarterbacks, I, Daniel Jones, Eli Manning, my father, I think of. Haas Stetler. Uh, Kerry Collins, yeah, right? Yeah. Have this way about them where it's just, it, it's always the same guy no matter what. Interception, same face. Touchdown, same face. And I do think that's a formula the Giants believe in, and I think it does work in the New York area. Why does the GM, Dave Gettleman, keep talking? Right. Just that, just let, let Daniel Jones play. We're going to find out if he can play, not by your words, not by a baker who gave you a bagel and said, hey, great draft pick. Right. You got to just go out and play. Just trust your evaluation. Who cares what people like me or you say about the pick? You know, they love the guy. That's where, hey, again, I did not think he was a first-round quarterback. I'll say that flat out. Now, do I think the criticism about the pick is a little over the top right now and on the player? Certainly. But this is New I York. Do. This is New York, and that's why it's it's been criticized yes. so much. But why don't why don't you think Daniel Jones was a first round talent? Well, for for me, when you talk about a first round talent and especially a top ten quarterback pick, I want a guy that's got some physically elite traits, right? Something about him where I go, whoa, and that's that's pretty special right there. What an athlete. Or, you know, what a great arm, what a great ability to throw the ball with people around him in the pocket and he can change the way he throws it or throws off his back foot. A guy that can carry the team when maybe the team isn't playing its best or going through a rough streak with injuries, all those things. That's where I looked at Daniel Jones and just went, I don't think he's that type of talent. He's not the type of guy where he's going to make a few throws every game and we're going to go, whoa, that was unbelievable. No, I think he's more of a guy that if you put a system around him and he's got a few good players around him, He can do some good things and be surgical with some of his accuracy throws underneath and his decision-making and all that. Uh, But I just didn't see that top-end talent, I guess, that I'd like to see at the the number six pick. Who do you think is a pro bowler first? Haskins, Locke, or Daniel Jones? Ooh, Haskins, Locke, or Daniel Jones. Yes, it's going to be very dependent on who gets in first out of that. That's a really good (laughs) question there. Um, I'm I'm gonna go with Drew Locke here, even though I don't really have an answer or a definitive reason. I don't think any of these guys are gonna go in and light the world up either in year one or year two. Well, it feels like Haskins might play before the other two. I I would think so. I mean, Haskins is in a situation where I think he's gonna step on the field the first day of practice, and he's gonna be next to a Colt McCoy and a Case McKean- a Case Keenum, and people the team's gonna look at him and go, "Whoa, he's big." 
whoa, the ball comes out of his hand a little different than the rest of these guys. And yes, I would think he's in the position to start earlier, certainly. Um, I, I guess I just go with Drew Locke because I'm a little biased there. He was my second favorite quarterback in the draft. I think he's the one that's capable of doing special things and making some of the special throws and moments that I was just describing of what you would like to see with a first-round quarterback or a top-ten pick. I had a scout tell me that they love Drew Locke. Yeah. But something's missing because he went in the second round. Right. What what what, what am I missing here? Well, I think the, the this happens with all quarterbacks, and I think this is a big issue with evaluating quarterbacks. We put all the team struggles and issues on the quarterback always. So if Drew Locke came out two years ago when he led college football with touchdown passes and he was uh, – had a better offense and coach and system around him. I think there's no doubt he's a first round pick. He's a top 20 pick. But, but isn't that strange? It's stupid. It happens all the time. He's not hot right now. It's like Tua going back, you know, Tua coming out next year. Right. You know, Haskins didn't go back to Ohio State. He knew I threw for 50 touchdowns. I'm hot now. Let's, Let's go. go. Right. Let's ride this. If you had it, if you looked at Tua and looked at Kyler. Yeah. Who's a, who has the potential to be a better pro quarterback? I think it's Kyler. I do. Yeah, I think Kyler. I, I like Tua. I'm not sold on Tua being the number one pick yet. I mean, if you ask me who's the number one pick, a quarterback next year off of just TV scouting and things I saw on cross, crossover watching film, yeah. I would say it's the kid up in, in Oregon. He Herbert. Would, yeah, Herbert would give me, you know, he would be the lead horse. And, but he uh, went back. He went back too, which I know. I I was saying at the time when he made the decision, I just went, gosh, you know, you, you know again, I'm, I'm all for kids – getting their education and and enjoying the college experience. But you only get a certain amount of years and and lifeline in the NFL. But I just want to, like, with the quarterback thing, like you said, I would just want to finish that thought because it is stupid how much it goes into every year. Oh, uh, You know, oh, the guy, it's always the guy on the good team with good stats. Oh, he's one of the top quarterbacks. Like Jake Fromm's been thrown in that conversation out of Georgia. I don't think Jake Fromm is that kind of quarterback, and he's not on the level of Tua or Herbert, but because he's on the good team and yeah. his stats go, we go, oh, he might be a first-round quarterback. Let me just tell you, that does not matter. Patrick Mahomes was 5-7 and seven his last year at Texas Tech. It's a team sport. we got to stop putting the quarterback on the pedestal in this country where it's Oh, it's the quarterback. He's the only guy doing anything out there. John Elway was three and eight his last year at Stanford. It's about the team around you. And I think a lot of times where NFL people miss out on their evaluations is they take too many of those things into account where they go, well, the team won. He's a winner. Oh, okay, great. He's a winner. Tim Tebow was a win winner in college. He did great things. I know that. But just because he won at Florida with like 10 other Pro Bowls yeah. around him <laughs> doesn't mean he is a, you know, bona fide NFL starting quarterback. He's Chris Sims, Pro Football Talk Live, co-host NBC Sports Network with Mike Florio, of course, a former NFL quarterback. Whose strategy? I don't like giving grades after the draft. Yeah, okay. Because it's, to me, how do I grade somebody? I don't even know. I haven't seen you even in a uniform. I got to wait three years to give you a grade. Yeah. Whose strategy did you like the most in the draft? Well, um, I, I, I think Pittsburgh made the boldest move of the draft for a position that they desperately needed. And that was outside their character of doing that, making trades. They don't usually do that type of stuff. So that was a bold move for a truly. But they had to find the replacement they, exactly for Ryan right. Shazier. They had to. It's been a really, it's a missing spot on their football team. And Shazier was a special football player. But I think when I think about the draft, there's a few teams that I think are playing chess while everybody else is playing checkers. The New England Patriots always, their strategy of accumulating not always for the top-end talent, but for the next guys down to build for depth, all of those things. They get value picks. I look at Chris Ballard with the Colts always oh, yeah, and go, he's special, okay? John Schneider with the Seattle Seahawks. I love what Seattle did Me. with with the picks that they got for Frank Clark. Exactly. I, I think they were sneaky great. I agree. I think uh, Seattle would be one of those teams I would put in and go, they won the draft in a lot of ways. I mean, some of those picks in the second round were special players that I think will, you know, be, become something down the road. I like Arizona's draft, too. I do, too. Like they, they addressed they, a lot of issues. Exactly. Arizona had a good free agency period. I think quietly Steve Kimes had a very good offseason. Um, you know, uh, who else am I missing? What about the Dolphins getting Josh Rosen? Uh, okay, I, I like that move, too. You get a second-round pick, basically late second-round pick to go, oh, this guy could be our franchise. And he's cheap. He's cheap as hell, and you got a guy, a, basically a one-year trial period, and they have all these assets that they've acquired as far as draft picks for next year's draft with Robert Quinn, Cameron Wake, and all of those things to where – now, okay, let's try it out. Josh Rosen, I expect him to be the starter down there in Miami. And if it works out, they're going to be able to use those assets in next year's draft for everything other than the quarterback. So I really thought that was a good move by, uh, by that group down there. 
Yeah, I was trying to think. I I, I don't know if if Jarrett Stidham is is considered the heir apparent be- mm-hmm. because the Patriots have drafted quarterbacks before. But here you are at Tom's age now. Yes, right. Is he? And I I had a scout tell me I give him a first round grade that, that I think he's really talented. We got caught up in how bad his team was. And the previous year, he was great. And we got caught up this year. In yes. The, right? Right. And he got into some bad habits. He was he was trying not to make mistakes. Uh-huh. And that the Patriots probably got a first-round talent at quarterback. Uh, agreed. I ranked him ahead of Daniel Jones, if that gives you anything oh, about wow. what I did. I thought he was a really talented quarterback. And, again, that was one of the names I was going to bring up about the conversation we had yeah. early. Here we are. We're going to put the team struggles all on one guy. Uh, Stidham does has a, has big time potential. I thought really, really he was every bit or more talented than Jer- Jimmy Garoppolo coming out of the draft. He's got a bit, a really big arm. It's sneaky, strong. He's very athletic, can do all the things we talked about, you know, again, throw from different angles, really reminded me of like a Tony Romo type of guy, really the way he played the game. But again, there's another guy where his team fell apart. The offense stunk. He had the worst pass protection on any of the quarterbacks I watched. And yeah, so then he, and then when you're in the SEC and you're the, the 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 lesser team on the field on a on a weekly basis, you tend to like a Drew Locke, take a few chances because you know if you don't, your team's not going to win the football game, and it can get thrown back in your face with the scouting department where they go, "Well, he threw a few risky interceptions there." Well, yeah, he was trying to win the game, so if he, he could have checked it down all day long and been Charlie check down, but they would have lost by 28 points. Is that what you wanted? No, so I do think the Patriots found, uh, you know, diamond in the rough. Shocker, the Patriots found a good player. Were you Charlie Checkdown? Uh, not at all. I was Bobby Bombs away. <laughs> <laughs> How often did you change a play? Uh, occasionally. Did you I, get yelled at? Well, Gruden, we never just called one play in the huddle, so it was always going to be two or three. I have. Give one, me an example. Well, uh, okay, we might go um, – all right, here's here's the huddle call. Uh, hey, west right slot, Z counter orbit, 72 Z bingo, U split. We're going to can it with 58 Lexus, Apple 314 <laughs> hammer, dummy snap count on one, ready, break. Okay, that would be the play call right there. Oh, and then I would walk up to the line of scrimmage and say Rocker or Tyson to remind everybody it was a dummy snap count because Rocker, the pitcher from Atlanta, was a John dummy. Rocker. Right, he was a dummy. And Whoa. Tyson, and that was our code word for being like dummy snap count, don't jump. I'd be like on Tyson, 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 Tyson. So those, we had a lot of code words. So in the John group. Rocker was the dummy. Yes, he was the dummy code and, word. And why was Tyson? I don't know why. I just I listened to whatever Gruden said, and they said, okay, sure. At that time, I think Tyson had just bit, you know, just off the fresh biting of the year of Evander <laughs> Holyfield and, and those type of things. But lots of code words. And, yeah, you, I get up to the line of scrimmage, and Blue five, Blue five said, hut, hut, hut. Okay. Oh, okay. I don't, we don't like this play. Check, check, check. And then it goes to the 58 Lexus. And if I said Apple, it would have gone to 314 Hammer. So uh, that's that's life as a quarterback it's, in the NFL. But it's one thing to be the quarterback, and you have to understand this and be the conductor. Right. There are other players who may not be as bright as the quarterback who are you know, going, right. wait, what's the snap count? They it, may not know the damn play. You're exactly right. That's why you hear New England always – you know, drafting and free agent signings of guys that are very smart because their systems are complex. They don't need that. They don't. They don't need Tom walking the line of scrimmage going. No, you run the post route here, <laughs> and then if they run this coverage, you run that. You know, but you're always going to have a few guys like that in the in the huddle, especially the young guys, uh, where you know there would be certain things. Hey, ask me. I'll tell you. Just don't ask me when we're already lined up in the middle of the snap count. Ask me as we're breaking the huddle. Did you ever I'll- have guys turn around and say, "What's the snap count"? Uh, oh, definitely. I mean, I had the center. I can remember playing Baltimore and John Wade in 2006 where it's hot as hell and it's the Baltimore Ravens and Ray Lewis and we're all stressed out because they're big and bad and physical. And we we uh, we had a dummy snap count on one and I remember him turning around in the middle of it like, wait, what's it on? And I was like, dummy one. dummy." You know, so, <laughs> so you're he, telling the defense. Yeah, right. Ray, and Ray was so smart. He was all over it. Yes. But is Ray talking to you? Ray is always talking when he was on the football field. One of the greatest experiences experiences I ever had in my short NFL career of playing uh the first snap of the game you know we wore all white because it was the first game of the year it's hot in Tampa Florida man Baltimore didn't give a crap they wore all black (laughs) and Ray Lewis was dancing around the ball singing it's football time because it was the first game of the year and we're not at a commercial break and I'm looking out there going man we're real nervous in this huddle 
And they, Terrell Suggs and him and everybody, they were real loose and ready to kick our butt, and they kicked our butt. That was good defense. Man. That was a really good defense. They had a, they had a couple Ooh, of them. Man, they, they did. Yeah. Yeah, and, and br brains to go along with Braun. I think that's what jumped out to me. I mean, Ray, he had a few plays that day where he called out the run, you know, as I'm going – said hut and he's going they're running right there and i'm like oh there you go michael Pittman. have fun with that one <laughs> good luck mike yeah. have fun yeah. see you in the huddle uh we'll take a break it's uh traeger meet friday we we do have meat out there but we're yeah. gonna go out let's throw some passes okay fine I, we are the first quarterback that we've had here oh i get to i get to christen the field yeah. well i don't know what that means i don't know either yeah. but hopefully you throw a completion i hope so too all right and then you can throw it as hard as you want at mclovin i mean you can just bring it sold yeah. deal I, I go back to Aaron Rodgers when Aaron Rodgers threw a ball so hard that I thought if McLovin's heart got in the way of that ball, he would have stopped his heart. Hey, Aaron Rodgers ball. The first time I saw it in person, I went, whoa, that's a different. It spins so hard and comes at you in such a hurry. Uh, that's why he's special. Well, Elway had that too. Elway did too. Brett Favre. Yeah. Marino in his prime. Those guys. Yeah. They could just absolutely sling it. We'll take a break here. We'll come back with Chris Sims and we'll close up shop here on this Meet Friday. We're back after this on the Dan Patrick Show. I'm catching it for Chris. Oh, oh yeah. I found it. I found go. it. It's right, a, right? Here we go. It took me a second to figure out how I wanted to throw this okay, thing. Let's bring Should, some I, cheese? Uh, Should what? I run around? What do you want me to do? Give me one of those fancy fucking some one of those fancy plates. Yeah. What do you want to do? You, you want to run a slant? Do you have padding in here? No. Why do you go? Oh, you've got your coat on. You have yeah. a down jacket on? No. You need to put a body vest on. <laughs> so, Here we go. You need to go down to the 10 and just come straight in. That would be like so, the bingo part. A basic right. in, right? Ooh. Booty five, booty five. Said hut. What is this? Oh, this is. Yeah. Oh. I can't see. Well, that, can't was see. A, ah. that was a very, that was a horrible route. Horrible. Not a quarterback. Was it friendly. rounded? Was it rounded? Uh, rounded, right? I gotta cut Two. it flat, right? Can you, do one. A, can you do a seven step and put some sauce on it? quick. You want me to put some sauce? Uh, yep. All right. Quarterbacks hate when you round the route, right? Nobody well, does a seven step drop anymore. Then you right? get there. They, well, yes, yeah, some do. But you're right. It's like coming like, out of side. Right. <laughs> we have room in this studio to go over the shoulder, right? See that angle like, exit. Yeah, like we decided well, do, it was called go, a go this way and then so, over that way. Then he'll okay. he'll lob it up. Yeah. That's better. I'll lead you right into the wall. Is that, in motion. Is that helmet okay on you? I can't really see very well. Okay. So funny. What could go wrong? What could go wrong? Set. Okay. Hut. He looks like he has no neck. Go on. Right, let's just see some speed. Go get I it. I can't see. Ah, oh. Right there. It was right there. Soft. Put it right there. Uh, I really couldn't see. How did nice Chris button hook with some sauce? Yeah, what? How about a button hook, McLovin, and, oh. and uh, Chris will bring some juice. All right. Why don't you for real? Hold on. Yeah. you bring some noise. All right. You're gonna go right there, gonna stay there? All right, here we go. I'll do a little, uh, I'll do a little Aaron Rodgers here, Ooh. okay? I'm gonna get the hole. <laughs> <laughs> he, he kinda... <laughs> oh, I missed it! Damn it! He's uh, Chris Sims, kind enough to join us on loan from the NBC Sports Network. And we're throwing the football around out uh, in, the, uh, in the field house there. McLovin looks like a receiver, uh, didn't act like a receiver. No, no, I let you down. No, Chris was throwing uh, with he, some juice there. He's bringing some cheese. Then. Yeah, I got a few. I was a little off target, but it's all right. I got it there. Do they care how strong your arm is now? Uh, like, do, do, like people care about my? No, no, no not oh. yours. <laughs> I'm talking. About... <laughs> it's like nobody cares no, about my arm no. anymore, Dan. Um, I care, right? But do we care? Like, how important is arm strength in the NFL? I, I again, I think it. I, you know, when people go, well, oh, you, you won't. Some people say that to me. You only like quarterbacks with strong arms. I go, yeah. Well, I like receivers that are fast and defensive tackles that are strong. <laughs> so yes, I do. You know, it's not the only thing in the world, but I do think there's a reason. You know, some of the great quarterbacks of all time had really strong arms. We mentioned a few before. Yeah, Elway, but Montana, Favre. Montana no, did. Montana did not. You're right. Certainly, he was a great passer. That's what like, my, my dad and uh, I would say. He's a little bit different that way where it's about rhythm and timing and anticipation. And Drew Brees is like that as well. It's not always about the power throws. But arm strength isn't important. You saw Patrick Mahomes this year. They can call plays in their offense that other teams can't call because they can go, well, our guy can hit that and throw it right on the money all the time. And so it gives the offensive play caller and play designer the ability to call different things for their offense that, yes, guys with their teams with other quarterbacks with less than average arms or average arms, they're not going to be able to dream of calling some of those plays. Why did everybody miss on Patrick Mahomes? 
my big thing is it was Texas Tech, so everybody thought, oh, this is just one of those system. They throw the ball every time. And then they looked at the 5-7 and seven record, and they thought, well, how good can he really be? Um, I don't I, – it was one of those, and, and you can go back and look at what I used to say on Bleacher Report at the time. I, I, I will pat myself on the back with this one, and, they, and even Patrick Mahomes has given me credit for this, is – I said the first time I watched this film, I can remember watching the film and I called my dad when I got done and I went, oh my gosh, dad, this Patrick Mahomes, you got to check him out. This guy is like unbelievable. I don't know if I've seen anybody throw the ball like him here in any, and in the recent history or anything like that. And um, I went on Bleacher Report, our podcast and said it and I got text messages from NFL people like right away. You're crazy. Mahomes isn't that good. What are you looking at? Blah, blah, blah. And then a few weeks went by and everybody was you know, his stock was rising. But what happens a lot of times is you'll have people in the media who have mock drafts and then they're surprised when somebody moves up. But the NFL teams get their hands on you. They're not going to let you know what they're going to do. No. And that's when I got word that I should have Patrick. A scout said you should have Patrick Mahomes on prior to the draft. He's moving up. Right. And we had him on. And then, of course, he moved up. He moved up. And a month before the draft, we had him on because I was told – He's the guy who's moving up. Yes. Him, him and Watson right. were moving up. Yeah. And it turned out to be true. It did. Well, it goes back to what we talked about a little earlier in the show is just elite traits, right? And those two guys had things where I went, well, there's just not many people in the history of the sport that can do some of the things they do. That's This is special. Like Watson's ability not only to make big throws, but dance around the pocket and make big throws and big moments. That was special. And then Mahomes... You know, there was enough special every game I watched where I just went, whoa, I mean, that is like, that's Aaron Rodgers type throws right there. And then people would knock him down and go, oh, what about the TCU game? And there was a few <laughs> games like this where I wanted to go, okay, that's great. But, you know, let's go back and watch some of those games together. Tell me who's open or who he's supposed to throw to in some of these moments. And, I never saw, yeah. I, I came in, I think they played Oklahoma State and I came in on Monday and I said, I don't know if he can play. Right. But I've never seen somebody look like they were in the backyard taking control and just, you know, having fun. And, right. and that's what we saw. Yep. Uh, Fritzy, what would you learn today, by the way? If the Sixers win it all, you're okay with giving McLovin a day off to attend the parade in Philadelphia? McLovin, what did you learn? Chris Sims, pretty decent jump shot. Uh, Seton O'Connor, what did you learn? People not interested in Chris Sims' arm strength anymore. Yeah. What's that all about? <laughs> Pauline, what did you learn? Mr. Trubisky loves you, Dan. Uh, what did you learn today, Chris? Uh, what did I, that this is, that it pays to be Dan Patrick and have a studio like this. That's what I learned. I mean, this is, gosh, can't hide money, Dan. For more Dan Patrick Show, tune into Audience Channel 239 on DirecTV. Stream for free on VR Live or download the Dan Patrick Show app.